Before that, here on BBC Radio 4, Lucy Hawking traces the development of speech, th- speech synthesis in Klatt's last tapes. You are listening to the voice of a machine. A, B, E, 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 F, D. Once upon a time, there lived a king and queen who had no children. Do I sound like a boy or a girl? How are you? I love you. I know not as it sounds, but the worst ways when I read them. Ah. I can serve as an authority figure. What did you say before that? Can you understand me, though I am whispering? To be or not to be? That is the question. My name is Lucy Hawking, and I have been regularly chatting to a user of speech technology, my father Stephen, for the past 28 years. I write adventure stories for primary age children about astronomy, astrophysics and cosmology. When I go to schools, I always talk about my father's use of speech technology and I tell the kids that even though my father may sound robotic when I play them a clip of him talking, I ask them to remember that actually it's a real man talking to them and it's a man who's using a computer to give himself back the voice that his illness has taken away from him. Development of speech synthesizers. 1. The voter of Homer Dudley, 1939. Will you please make the voter say for our Eastern listeners, good evening, radio audience. To find out where speech technology started, I went to Saarland University in Germany, where two researchers have built a model of the first ever voice machine. It was originally created in the 18th century by inventor, scientist and impresario Wolfgang von Kempelen. Hello. 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 Good morning. Please come in. Thank you so I'm very much. Very pleased to meet you. Hello. Hello. My name is Jürgen Trouvin. I'm a lecturer and researcher here at the Department of Computational Linguistics and Phonetics. Saarland University, and I also interested in the history of speech communication devices, like the one of von Kempelen, for example. Kempelen was uh, both a good showman and a very good scientist, but he was really like a sort of a genius, a real engineer, because he was interested in building things which can function and can help also people. My name is Fabian Brakane. What do you think the relationship was between von Kempelen's original inspiration and the organ? Uh, It's a very curious thing because there is a stop in the pipe organ called Vox Humana. And when this stop was invented in the 17th century, it should be a a representation of the human voice playing the organ. So they wanted to take the vox humana from a musical note, something you'd find in compositions of the time, to actually be able to produce human speech. Exactly, yes. But Campbell knew very well that this stop couldn't be the solution to get a, a, a speech synthesis. Three, Pat, the parametric artificial talker of Walter Lawrence, 1953. What did you say before that? And so we're looking at von, uh, a model of von Kempelen's speech machine, the door of which has just fallen off. Uh, it looks like um, it looks like a small birdhouse. So we're taking the lid off the box, which houses the yeah. speech machine. And so Fabian's putting one hand through one hole with his elbow on the bellows, which represent the lungs. And his other hand is coming underneath the rubber cone, which what does the rubber cone represent? The mouth. The mouth. It's so that's his under so the hand under the mouthpiece. Uh. <laughs> Oh, it's creepy. <laughs> Sorry. 
So it's uh, these are the both best words he she could say. So you have the uh, nose to be opened. So um, Fabian is moving his hand rapidly over the mouthpiece and using two fingers over the um, the nostrils effectively while pressing down with his elbow on the lungs. Fabian is actually mouthing the words mama and papa while the machine is saying them. Or the UVA Cascade Format Synthesizer of Gunnar Font, 1953. How are you? I love you. Whether Lucy is able to. Should we see? Yeah. Should we see? Perhaps I can. So there's your instructor. Yeah. Right. If so you want to say M, you have to close the mouth and yep. the nostrils um, have the nostrils to be opened. The nostrils are open for M. And if you want to say A, mm. you have to move the uh, hand backwards. So just ma, ma, so while pressing the. While pressing. Mm -hmm. Um. I did that with three syllables. I'll try with <laughs> two this time. <laughs> right. And what about Papa? How would I do Papa? Um, the same way, but you have to close the nostrils. Okay. Well. So. Papa. <laughs> Let's see if I can just do it with two syllables this time. Papa. <laughs> Um, is, can I get her to say anything else? Or can I, will I be, would I be able to make it say um, any other words? If you don't cover the mouth, it's an A. <coughs> and the more you cover the mouth, um, the, the vowel quality changes. knew that the missing of the tongue was a very important thing and in his book he wrote to his readers to invent this machine forward but nobody uh, could invent it with a tongue with teeth so that it could uh, speak more than this few very few things <laughs> It seems to me that his aim was actually to give a voice to people who couldn't yeah. speak. And so he must have hoped for further development of his machine because he can't have imagined that it would just be mama and papa or the yeah. short sentences. He must have had in mind this idea that people would be able to speak freely, yeah, mechanically. Yeah. And there was a plea in that book uh, Fabian mentioned, please reader, uh, that means researchers in the, in the, in the late, for the later generations, please go on with the development of that machine. So we are still trying to do that, yeah. 16. Output from the first computer-based phonemic synthesis by rule program, created by John Kelly and Louis Gersman, 1961. To be or not to be, that is the question. It would be really nice to get a sense of the progression from a mechanical to electrical to computer solutions to providing a, a voice for people who can't speak. I'm not sure whether there was actually, actually a smooth transition from mechanical systems like uh, Van Kamplen's to the first electrical ones. I only know that all of a sudden that, that's how it looks. My name is Bernd Möbius. I'm uh, the professor of phonetics and phonology at Saarland University in the 1930s. Uh, there was an ele electrical system around the so-called Voder, built by Homer Dudley, that was demonstrated at the World, World Fair in, in New York, I believe, in 1937. For example, Helen, will you have the Voder say, She saw me. That sounded awfully flat. How about a little expression? Say the sentence in answer to these questions. Who saw you? She saw me. Whom did she see? She saw me. Well, did she see you or hear you? She saw me. During the demonstration at the World Fair, um, there was a, a female operator of the system 
who played the device a little bit like, an, like a church organ. About how long did it take you to become an expert in operating the voter? It took me about a year of constant practice. This is about the average time required in most cases. We have to go up to the what is the, the floor next to the top the top floor, yeah. Um, I'm now just getting into an elevator which apparently I can talk to, so does it speak English? <laughs> Hopefully, yes. Okay. Oh, hello elevator. It doesn't say hello back. You must be patient with that. That's <laughs> Maybe with German. Hello, Aufzug. Hi there. Where can I take you? The third floor. Third floor. Okay. I'm bringing you to the third floor. Bye bye. Bye now. 19. Rules to control a low dimensionality articulatory model by Cecil Coker, 1968. I'm Eva Lazacek, and I'm a PhD student and working in articulatory synthesis. The actual situation right now is that it's very hard to simulate women's voices because they have a slightly different characteristics and if you just tune up the F0, the fundamental frequency or the pitch of the voice, it starts sounding um, really artificial. And what you actually have to do, you have also to alter the articulation. So an A, ah, when I or when we speak an A, ah, it's different from a male long vocal tract A. Ah. So you have, you cannot easily interpolate the articulation. Because of course it would be awful for women not only to be using a speech synthesizer but then to be coming out with a man's voice. Yeah. <laughs> I mean that would constitute, that would be a real loss of identity. Yeah, exactly. This is the result of trying to imitate a female voice by increasing the pitch. 24. The first full text-to-speech system done in Japan by Noriko Numeda et al. 1968. Once upon a time, there lived a king and queen who had no children. But I think it's also important to, uh, to think of children, for example, growing up. And, of course, at the beginning, to speak with an adult's voice, even the sex would be the same, would be awful, I think. Definitely very important, just for making friends. It's going to be very hard for a child, speaking with an adult's voice, to actually communicate with kids of their own age. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. But at the moment we don't know very much about the speaking voice uh, of, of children coming uh, adults, for example. What's really happening during maturation of the vocal folds? So the aim is to create speech machines which can grow up with somebody. That would be really nice. Then you would have shown a real knowledge about what's going on in your voice during a lifespan at least of the f first, say, 20 years or so. 21. Sentence-level phonology incorporated in rules by Dennis Klatt, 1976. The delight of a Christmas went all through the house. Not a creature was stirring, not even a mouse. Tell us a bit for people, people who don't maybe know who Dennis Klatt is. Could you put him in context? Yeah, he's, he's definitely one of the pioneers of speech synthesis in the technological sense, but also in providing an interface for non-experts who could basically type in text and get a synthetic speech out of the system, which wasn't possible so before, I think. Before CLAT, you would actually have to be a specialist in order to be able to input what you wanted to say. Exactly. Okay, Laura, can you, can you hear me? I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, I've got you. That's fantastic. This is Dr. Laura Fine, the daughter of Dennis Klatt. Dennis Klatt is really the father of the modern speech machine. He created Deck Talk, a system which takes text, inputted by the user, and turns it into speech. Dennis Klatt also produced the definitive history of speech devices, which includes a collection of recordings of each device throughout the 20th century. He really was interested in making a natural and intelligible system.
So the most important qualities of a speech synthesis system are really the naturalness and the intelligibility. And he was very much interested in making those of high quality. One of the unique contributions was that he used not only his understanding from an engineering standpoint and a speech production standpoint, but he also asked for analysis with perception data. How do people interpret speech? And what is it in the listener that helps them determine, is this a child, is this a female, is this a male? Uh, what cues are important? And that really helped him to make an intelligible system that incorporated different age speakers and different genders. Do I sound like a boy or a girl? My mother came across this drawing that my father made of the different speakers. In the center, we have Perfect Paul. This is a picture of my father. I am Perfect Paul, the standard male voice. And then this is Beautiful Betty, which is the standard female voice. And that is a, a picture that he drew of my mother. I am Beautiful Betty, the standard female voice. Some people think I sound a bit like a man. <laughs> <laughs> this is Kit the Kid, who's a 10-year-old yeah. child. So this is a picture of me. My name is Kit the Kid, and I am about 10 years old. With my nice short haircut. Oh, is as that a you? Child. I was a lab rat as a, as a child. I spent a lot of time at MIT. My father had a candy drawer. I spent hours with him at MIT in his laboratory, and he took snippets of my voice and uh, that helped to develop the child's voice. I love that they're called the Deck Talk Gang. The Deck Talk Gang. That's a great, that's a great title. So there's my father in later years, and underneath the, the caption says, Huge Harry, kind of older gentleman's voice. I am Huge Harry, a very large person with a deep voice. I can serve as an authority figure. Laura, I have to tell you something. Uh, Perfect Paul sounds just like my dad. I mean, I think that's amazing. Is Perfect Paul based on your father's voice? Yes. Which, which yeah. therefore means that my father is actually speaking with your father's voice. It's amazing. He would be so, so thrilled. I think one of the things that strikes me about your father is, is his humanity in that he was obviously an amazing scientist who yet managed to do something that has had a very profound impact on people's day-to-day -day lives, um, but also that he had quite a sense of humour. He did. <laughs> Is it, is it true that he gave his synthesizer the ability to sing happy birthday to you? <laughs> he did. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy um, birthday one of the ironies is as a 40-year-old man, he began to be somewhat hoarse because he had thyroid cancer. And um, he had had a thyroidectomy, but his vocal cords were affected by the disease. And so he, w he spoke in later years with a raspy voice. And uh, I think he understood all too well your father's challenges in terms of communication. So he had a real sense himself of what it would actually be like to find that you had no voice. Yes. My father unfortunately passed away at age 50 way too young but he and he knew that he had a terminal illness really when I was quite young he knew that he would not be around perhaps to see me um, graduate from college but he was always so optimistic I think it's been such an amazing experience for me to talk to you about how your father's life has been transformed by my father's research and I had never really thought before that my father's voice lives on 33. The Clatt Talk System by Dennis Clatt of MIT, which formed the basis for Digital Equipment Corporation's Deck Talk System, 1983. According to the American Speech and Hearing Association, there are over one million people in the United States who are unable to speak for one reason or another. I will show you the way that you can write using my eyes. At first, when people meet me, as someone who is unable to speak, they seem to assume that you have some form of mental deficiency. I will show you the way that you can write using my eyes. This is Michael Kubis, and Michael lost his voice from a stroke some years ago. Some people will talk to me as if I have a learning disability. I find this quite funny, as some of them act in the most ridiculous way. 
Some of them catch on fairly fast and realize that I'm perfectly sane. Others continue to act this way though, which is funny and completely bizarre. People are, are quite anxious about how to approach someone with a disability. And, in, and that's what Michael does. He puts people at their ease, you know, so that it is easy to communicate with him. Mick Donegan's speciality is in eye gaze technology, and that means using the movement of the eye in order to generate text, which can then be turned into speech. Could you explain a bit more to us about gaze control, about the kind of technology that we have just had a conversation with Michael using? It's a system, it's based on a very powerful camera system combined with low-level infrared lights. The actual technology has been around probably two or three decades, but the significant change that's happened this century is that systems began to cope with significant involuntary movement. That means that the significant numbers of people with cerebral palsy, for example, who have involuntary movement, suddenly that group of people were able to use the system, people with MS who have involuntary movement. 11. The DAVO Articulatory Synthesizer developed by George Rosen at MIT, 1958. When I first tried Michael with eye gaze technology, we used a, just a, a lower case system and Michael was very unhappy about that. He was insistent that I put capital letters, full stops, commas, semicolons, because it's really important to, for him to show everyone that he is a fully literate guy who is able to speak independently and at the highest literacy level. When we know our A, B, C. Mick, I wondered if you could tell us a bit about how you see the future of this technology developing. I've just finished being an advisor for a European project on brain-computer interfaces and disability. And for me, it's an, that's a technology that excites me because for those people who are completely locked in, who can't even move their eyes, then there is no other way to go other than to use a brain-computer interface. At the moment, you know, that it's kind of inconvenient because for the best signal, well, in fact, for the best signal, you need an implant. But the second best signal is to actually wear a cap and that to have gel on it etc but there are various dry caps being developed that have a reasonable signal as I understand it. I'm always asked how to talk to my father and it would be great to know what advice you would give to people who are not familiar with speech machines but who would like to have a conversation with you. I would ask them not to ask long questions and be patient because it can take a long time to answer. Also please bear in mind that it can be very tiring for those using speech output devices. The question of whether I would change my voice given the opportunity is a difficult one. And I suddenly have that opportunity. This is acclaimed filmmaker Simon Fitzmaurice, who has lost his voice through MND. This voice, my voice, is a generic one that came with the computer, turning an Irish man into an American overnight. But it has become my voice. Yeah, this is actually something that we have in mind as a real application for for people who know that there is a, a chance that they will lose their voice to record themselves such that the experts will be able to build a speech synthesizer that has that person's voice. There are two key issues in the question of changing my voice. What I think about my voice and what those closest to me think and feel about my voice. And I can tell you what my children feel straight away. They find the idea of me changing my voice completely abhorrent. Just recently I was testing out another computer, when I glimpsed, out of the corner of my eye, my two middle boys, standing outside the door, their heads close together, whispering. They are four and six years of age. They're whispering and looking in my direction. It turns out they are discussing the strange voice coming out of this different computer. Later, back on my own computer, it's bedtime, and Rafe, my six-year-old, comes to give me a kiss. I type up, good night, on my screen. No, say it. I say it, good night. He turns to his brother at the door. You see, I told you, it's the same. Someone's voice is part of their identity. 
integral to their perceived makeup. It's funny though, I feel less protective of my computer voice than others. Probably because my voice inside my head is what is familiar to me. My thoughts, not the voice that expresses them. Recently, I came across a video on YouTube of a doctor in Sweden, with motor neuron disease. And there it was. My voice, out of someone else's computer. Identical. It was a little unnerving. So I decided to see if I could get some semblance of my old, spoken voice, back. Uniquely mine. I've been working with a company in Edinburgh, Sarah Proc, the world leaders in synthetic speech, who have built a synthetic voice out of old recordings of my spoken voice. I was lucky enough to have a recording of me reading some of my poetry and other recordings. However, because of the lack of data, in comparison to someone who would deliberately bank their voice, my synthetic voice is limited by the amount of original material. As a solution Sarah Parak are now in the process of using my father's voice as a similar source from which to fill in the missing DNA and to build a harmonious, rounded voice. Harmonious, rounded voice. I wait the results. I wait the results. So, the question remains. The question remains. Will I change my voice? Will I change my voice? And more importantly, will my children allow it? Will my children allow it? 30. The MIT My Talk System by Jonathan Allen, Sherry Hunnicutt, and Dennis Klatt, 1979. Speech is so familiar a feature of daily life that we rarely pause to define it. End of the demonstration. These recordings were made by Dennis Klatt on November 22, 1986. Amazingly, we've progressed from von Kempelen's 18th century machine, which had a limited vocabulary, to being able to recreate the exact voice that was lost and give it expression, meaning and modulation in a way that mimics the naturally produced voice. Soon, speech technology users will be able to make their voices smile. Clats last tape was presented by Lucy Hawking. Do I sound like a boy or a girl? The recordings were made available by the Acoustical Society of America. A, B, C, D. The sound design was by Nick Romero. How are you? I love you. It was produced by Julian Mayers. Ah. It was a Sweet Talk production for BBC Radio 4. Thank you for listening, and good luck on all your cosmic journeys.